let's get started. Okay, so a couple brief announcements. Um, don't uh, forget, so obviously we're not having class on Monday because of the holiday, and uh, we're not going to have class on Wednesday, so I'm not going to be here. So we're meeting today, but we're not going to meet in person until the following Friday, so y'all get a little bit of a break. Um, now, not too much of a break, though, because I'm assigning the first homework assignment today, so homework number one, which is on tributary area and on gravity loads. So last time uh, in class, we did a tributary area example, and so... I think after uh, yesterday, or yesterday, or after Wednesday, I think you'll probably have a little bit of an idea of what's on the assignment. Um, definitely uh, after today, I think you'll have a, a complete picture of what's going on. Um, so, sound good? And, and I'll pull up the assignment and pull up some stuff here in a little bit to make sure everybody's uh, clear. Sound good? Okay. All right, so uh, let me get back to sort of our lecture just to sort of get everybody up to speed. Um, oh, let me go up a little bit. Okay, I think this is probably a reasonable place to uh, uh, to get started. So, uh, you know, just sort of recap and get everybody back up to speed. So, up up until now, we've been talking just about the general process of uh, of structural engineering. The idea that you know we need to characterize the loads on on a structure and then the resistance, how much that structure uh, can hold up. And as long as the resistance is greater than or equal to the loads, uh, we know that the structure uh, has been designed uh, safely and accordingly. Uh, and so last time what we did is we did a full-blown uh, example trying to take a representative floor system subjected to a, 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 a pressure load, a 20 PSF uh, a pressure load, and take that and, and sort of break it down and do what's uh, called a load takedown. Take that uh, 20 pounds per square foot load and say, okay, well, how does that translate into shears and moments on a beam? How does that translate into axial loads on a column and whatnot? And so I think after our lecture last time, I think that, that should be pretty clear. You know, for instance, if you have a beam uh, that uh, has a tributary width of 10 feet, so that 20 pounds per square foot pressure load would translate into a 200 pounds per foot uniformly distributed load. And so if you have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, you should be able to determine reaction, shear diagram, moment diagram, all that uh, fun stuff. And so are there any questions about that problem that we did in class about the example problem? I think ultimately the, the math was really easy. I mean, it wasn't like we were breaking out the differential equations or anything. It was pretty straightforward. And, and hopefully I, I think that you see where we were going with that. Sound good? Okay. Now, that example was predicated on sort of a, a blanket assumption at the beginning. You know, here's a floor uh, plan, and let's assume that the load is 20 pounds per square foot. Do the analysis. Well, that's great. Well, where the heck did the 20 pounds per square foot come from? I mean, why 20? Why wasn't it 50 or 60 or 80 or why? Um, so we started to talk a little bit last time about structural loads, about where they come from. Uh, depending upon the load that you're looking at, um, it can come from either, you know, if you're talking about dead loads, it can come from manufacturers, you know, suppliers. You know, how much does the carpet weigh in this building? Well, probably the best source is whoever manufactured the carpet. Um, ASCE 7, however, is sort of a, a generalized document that's uh, applied to all sorts of uh, uh, different structures and characterizes pretty fundamental loadings on, on structural systems, you know, uh, uh, wind, earthquake, snow, uh, et cetera. Um, we're not going to use ASCE 7 directly, but basically I'm, I'm piecing out all of the fundamental information that I, I, I think you need to be uh, aware of in order to, to get a handle on this stuff. Uh, and this, the stuff that we're doing in here is pretty, pretty standard uh, uh, structural engineering uh, computation. So it's, it's not anything that's uh, uh, off the mark. Um, and so I think we sort of, this is where uh, we, we hit the tail end of our lecture last time. We were talking about dead loads. So uh, again, in structural engineering, what we do is we, we sort of, you know, parse out the, the uh, types of loads that we uh, apply to structures, you know, separately. We don't look at just uh, loads on the structures as one big, you know, oh, here's 20 kips. We take those loads and we split them up into various categories. And, and the reason for that is because each load type and each classification of load carries with it a different degree of uncertainty. Uh, for instance, dead loads, in other words, the structure's permanent self-weight, any, you know, attachment that's not going anywhere, anything that's sitting still, uh, those, those permanent loads uh, that are stationary have with them a different degree of uncertainty than, say, earthquakes or uh, uh, wind or snow or something like that. 
So, so as a result, the resulting load factors are, uh, are different as well. So we handle those uh, separately. Now, a couple values that I think uh, just as civil engineers you just kind of need to know uh, are some unit weights. And there, there are just some values that you just need to memorize. Like what's the unit weight of water at 62.4 pounds per cubic foot? It's just a sort of a number that you can set your watch by. Well, uh, the unit weight of steel, uh, of structural steel, uh, is taken as 490 pounds per cubic foot. And that's a value uh, we'll see used uh, in steel design uh, here and there. Uh, in this course, um, obviously, we're going to be dealing with reinforced concrete. And unless otherwise noted, uh, a typical unit weight for reinforced concrete, uh, for normal weight reinforced concrete, uh, is about 150 pounds per cubic foot. Now, just so you're aware, actual just concrete uh, typically weighs usually around like 145 pounds per cubic foot, uh, but we throw in the, the extra little bit to account for the steel. You know, it's reinforced concrete. It has steel inside it. So the unit weight goes up a little bit. Now this is for normal weight reinforced concrete, and this is an estimate. You know, as you know, concrete is it's a variable material. You know, the, the, the unit weight can change. But 150 is a pretty common uh, value used for design purposes. It's a, it's a nice, round, uh, upper bound uh, value, if you will. Um, other uh, dead loads you can look up in ASCE 7 or you can get from the manufacturer. Uh, again, and it just depends on, on the system that you're looking at. For instance, if you're designing, let's say, this building, you know, you think you look up here, these floor beams up here have to support uh, a series of loads. Well, what do they have to support? They have to support their own self-weight. They have to support uh, the, the concrete deck, the metal formwork that's used. They have to support mechanical, electrical, and plumbing allowances, the suspended ceiling, the carpet, all, all of that stuff. And so each of those different components carries with it a, a certain weight. Uh, and you can look this stuff up. It's, it's pretty easy. ASC 7 just has oodles and oodles of tables of different uh, fundamental quantities. And if ASCE7 doesn't list your specific type of carpet or your specific drop ceiling or whatnot, well, go to the manufacturer. They're going to report how heavy these elements are. They need to because as structural engineers, we need to understand those weights for the purposes of design. And so I, I guess my point is, is that dead load estimation is actually pretty simple. I mean, you have a floor. You know there's, let's, let's just take carpet, for instance. You have a floor. Uh, you know the area of the, car of the floor, you know how much carpet's being put on it. It's pretty straightforward to determine the loads on, on the beam. It's pretty simple. Um, the only thing that I think, yes? That's a good question, and, and, and the answer is yes. Typically, we would consider furniture to be a live load because it's related to occupancy. Okay? E exactly. It, well, th that's a that's a that's actually that's a great question. Um, and there's a couple ways that we we assess that. Here, here, let me give you an example. Um, we're going to talk about live load reduction here in a second, so I'm gonna come back to to how we would handle this. Um, and so I think I'll be able to answer your question a little with a little more specificity here in a few minutes, but. The live loads that we use for certain occupations vary. So for instance, a library. The live loads for a library are way higher than the live, the live loads for a, a classroom. But typically when you are, ex, when you are uh, uh, expressing, like here's the live load for let's say uh, a hotel room. Well that includes not just the people, you know, you know, guests in the room, but all of the furniture that goes along with it, the bed and, and all that, because that's what the room is being used for. If the room was being used for uh, uh, an office, well, the live load changes because the stuff that's in the room changes. Does that make sense? Like, like think about it like this. If you had a hotel room versus an office, the same person could be in both of those rooms, but the stuff is going to be different. So the live load is different as a result. But I have another point I want to bring up here in a second, and that'll be a little clearer when we talk about reduction. All right, I think I did talk about this last time, but I do sort of want to reiterate, one of the most fundamental loads that we need to be able to compute is self-weight, particularly the self-weight on, uh, on a beam. So let's say you have a beam that's meant to hold up, you know, point loads, distributed loads, what have you. It also has to hold up itself. It has to be able to support its own self-weight. 
If you're talking about reinforced concrete beams, it's not off the mark if you have a beam that's three, four hundred pounds per foot. That, that's not exactly light as a feather. That, that's, that can be some pretty significant load. So the way that we compute that, uh, that uniformly distributed load along the beam, is we take the unit weight and we multiply it by the area, the cross-sectional area of the, uh, of the beam. And how do you get that? Well, the total weight of the beam is gamma times the volume. And the volume is, you know, you know, width times height times length. Well, if you want the weight per foot or the weight distributed along the length, take that computation and divide it by L. Hence, that's why you get, you know, gamma BH or gamma times the area. So later on, when we start doing beam design, I'm going to ask you how heavy is the beam. And so when I take gamma and I multiply it times the cross-sectional area, and you know, how does that equal the length or the, the distributed load of the beam? This is how. So everybody okay with that? Don't worry, we'll, we'll see this again, and, and I think you'll see where, uh, uh, where this is coming from. We'll definitely close the loop on this one. Okay, so live loads. So like I said, live loads do depend on the application. It does depend on what you're looking at uh, and, uh, uh, and what the structure is being used for. I tend to re like to refer to live loads as occupancy loads. In other words, live loads represent what the structure is being used for, what the occupants are using the, the structure, uh, uh, you know, in what capacity. So the live loads for office buildings are different than the live loads for hospitals or for schools or what have you. Um, and, and it can be anything from the people, loads from the storage, uh, equipment, machinery. Uh, usually, uh, now I know machinery can get a little, uh, that can be a little different. Like, are you going to consider that dead load or live load? Um, basically, the, the, the big ticket, the big, the big sort of um, point I want to get across is that dead loads we tend to consider as permanent that are not going anywhere at all, whereas live loads are what we consider to be transient. In other words, live loads can move. You know, I can take this table and I can move it. Okay? I can take that chair and I can move it. I can move myself. So all of us in this room, uh, that instructor station, we would be considered live loads acting uh, on, the, on the floor. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, we talked about this last time uh, that, you know, you see some of these loads and you say, okay, well, the, the live load in an office building in some areas might be 50 pounds per square foot. What is 50 pounds per square foot? I personally have a hard time visualizing that. I really don't understand what, that, what 50 pounds per square foot means. So uh, these images come from the LRFD uh, pedestrian bridge uh, design guide and or, or design spec, and I think they're kind of nice. This is a, 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 it's about a six foot by six foot square, and basically what they did is they started putting people in it to where you as an engineer could say, okay, that's about what 50 pounds per square foot looks like. So it's about 12 people in a six by six square. So th this is what 50 pounds per square foot looks like. This is what 100 pounds per square foot looks like, and that's what 150 pounds per square foot looks like. That's a lot. That's a lot of people, okay? So I guess my question about live loads is, what's the probability that these loads would be applied all over an entire floor area all at one time? And, and I think to clarify that question, if you took this classroom, this classroom you know, that we're in right now, and you looked at uh, a typical classroom load of 40 pounds per square foot, and you did the math based off of these images, we're looking at about 100 people in this room, okay? Now, have you ever been in this room or a room like this and, ha and there been that many people? Not even steel design has that many people. I mean, there's a lot, but there's, there's not that many. So the, the point I want to make is that the loads that are expressed in, uh, in ASC 7 and in these tables are uh, the loads that you see here. They're sort of observed upper bound maximum loads. Okay? But it does beg a question. Um, what's the probability that these loads are going to be implied over the entire floor area all the time? And, and the answer is not likely. You know, it's really, really not going to happen. So ultimately what we can do is we can take those specified live loads and we can reduce them to take into account the probability that it's not going to see that full load all the time. Hence, live load reduction. Okay? So this is ASCE7's expression for live load reduction. It's one of the most fundamental uh, equations uh, in, in structural engineering. 
Uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this uh, a, a little bit just so everybody can, can kind of be aware of what's going on. And I might go back to your question uh, here in a second. So what you do with live load reduction is you take L0. L0 is the original unreduced live load that's specified for your given application. So basically L0 is what you look up. And you take L0 and you multiply it by uh, what you see uh, uh, in, in parentheses, the 0.25 plus 15 over that uh, square root. It's a pretty simple calculation, uh, but basically what you're doing uh, in that computation is you are reducing that load into one that's a little more applicable for design. Now, the units are, the, the, the calculation is pretty simple. All you need is A sub T, which is a tributary area, and this term KLL, which is li uh, a live load element factor. I'm going to talk about KLL uh, here in a second. Um, but I also want to uh, talk about what's going on in this box. Because what's going on uh, in this box is, is really kind of important. Let me talk about the first bullet point. Live load reduction does not apply for the following. Okay? And I want to talk about the second one. It says any time that L0 is greater than 100 pounds per square foot. Okay, let's talk about that point because that's actually a really important point. What that's saying is, is that any time you have a really, really large unreduced load, anything over 100 pounds per square foot, you're not allowed to reduce it. So here's an example. For classrooms, the specified live load is 40 pounds per square foot. Whereas for libraries, the specified live load is 150 pounds per square foot. Now why is the live load for libraries so much larger? The books, okay? Now here's the thing. In a classroom, what's the probability that a classroom sees, uh, like this is gonna see 100 people? Pretty low, right? What's the probability that a library is going to see 150 pounds per square foot? It's pretty high, right? Because the, the books are there and they're not going anywhere, right? I mean, how often have, have you ever gone into the library and see it completely rearranged or the books stacks suddenly vanish? Now, those books stacks are usually there and they're not going anywhere. So what the spec says is that any time that your uh, unreduced live load is over 100 pounds per square foot, you can't reduce it. And so that, that's the spec's way of saying, no, you actually do need to use that load for a very specific reason. So that might sort of go into your question, whether or not it's a library or file storage. You don't reduce loads in those instances for that very reason. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Does the does the <laughs> that's a, that's a reasonable question. Does the average structural engineer need to like directly take that into account? No. And here's why. That ASCE seven spec that I mentioned. It, it's not like that book was published 30 years ago and it's never changed. They update that spec every year. And it's not just live loads. They update wind speed maps. They update snow maps. They update seismicity maps. So every so often that data gets updated. So you might, I mean, in all honesty, we might open up the, the ASC 7 spec one day and we might find that the corridor load in offices went from 80 to 85 because, because of what you're saying. So as long as you're using the most up-to-date spec, you can be assured that that, that data is representative. Because that data, it doesn't come from us just sitting in a room figuring out what we think makes sense. It comes from actually going out and measuring responses in buildings and saying, okay, let's translate that into loads that we actually use. So, so the short answer, I mean, we do have to account for variances in loads, but, but we don't have to do it in, you know, individually. The specs take care of that for us. So, we, we, Let's move on. <laughs> let's let's move on. Oh, hold on. Oh, okay, this is the the. the <laughs>
money, money, money. But, but let, let, that's the short answer, but let me give you a, a little bit more of a realistic answer, okay? Because th there is something to this. And, and this is where I think the, the engineer students in the room that are the, the, the you know, super, you know, fans of, of deriving equations and solving and, you know, getting x equals 2, this is where I think you start to get a little frustrated. The facts are, you know, we're, you're getting to a point where some of the phenomenon and some of the, the problems that we have to deal with uh, in structural engineering are very, very complicated. Um, what I'm getting at is sometimes there isn't a way of just solving for x equals 2. For something like this, if we're talking about just the instance of live load reduction or live loads in buildings, that's a very, very complicated task. I mean, you have to measure all these responses, and then you have this big data set, and you're trying to come up with an equation that makes sense. And not only that, but you're trying to come up with an equation that's easy to use. And I'm just talking about one phenomenon, but there's oodles of, of phenomenons in structural, or phenomena in structural engineering where deriving a closed form simple expression just isn't possible. So the answer is coming up with an empirical expression like this. So an, an example that we're going to see later in steel design is the phenomenon of shear lag. The equations and the math behind that are ridiculous. And there's no way that an engineer is going to perform that math for every single structure that they design. You're not going to go and collect data on 30 years worth of live loads in buildings to design a regular old office building. But you need an expression that represents what's going on as best as possible. Hence where, where this stuff comes into play, okay? So, like, for instance, okay, one of the things that you see in this expression is, okay, you have an equation, but you also have these limits on it, okay? One of the reasons for these limits is this, okay? So you compute uh, this expression, but it says also reduction is limited to 0.5 uh, L0 for members supporting one floor and 0.4 L0 for members supporting multiple floors. The reason is, is that if your tributary area goes through the roof, this equation will reduce your live load, you know, something fierce, okay? Uh, but the idea is, well, I don't care what this equation says. I have, I don't care. You're still limited to a, to a certain degree. Does that make sense? So, so I, I wish that I could tell you that from here on out, all of the equations you can just solve for x and that's the answer. You're going to have some empirical expressions that you're going to have to sort of just accept. Like when we look at um, modulus of rupture equation, the units, they don't work. And if you're somebody who loves to track units, you're going to look at that equation and it's going to drive you nuts. But it's an empirical expression, so it's one of those things you have to accept. What, what do you mean different? Well, not really different types of structures, but different types of structural elements. So, so for instance, the, these two elements, okay, so let's take this. So whenever you apply live load reduction, you're limited to, like you can't reduce it more than 50% for members supporting one floor and for 40% for members supporting multiple stories. So pop quiz, give me a type of element in a building that's only supporting one story. You're looking at you're kind of looking at it already. A beam, right? So typically you're only reducing 50% for beams. Now, another pop quiz. What's a member that's supporting more than one story? A column. There you go. See? So now the code writes it that way because you might have a structure where it's a little different. You might have a transfer girder that's supporting multiple stories. So it, it just depends. You'll find language in the spec where it's written in a really weird way because there are scenarios where different situations would apply. So, does that make sense? One other thing that, that's worth mentioning is that your live load reduction does not apply whenever you have a beam or an element with a really small influence area. I use that term influence area uh, uh, very critically. Your, your KLL times AT, if it's less than or equal to 400 square foot, we say, I ah, don't worry about it that's small enough, it doesn't really matter. So that might also kind of play into your question as well. Does this sound good? Like I said, it, it's a really plug and chug expression. The only thing I have not adequately explained is a live load element factor. Live load element factors, first off, they're very, very easy lookups, but I kind of want you to understand what they are. Okay, so let me show you something. All right, 
I'm going to, real quick, take one of these, let's say, interior floor beams. Would you agree that this That's the tributary area, right? Halfway over and halfway over. So we'll call this A sub T, okay? Now, if the tributary area is halfway over, we say we, we have a term in engineering called the influence area, and we say the influence area is all the way over. So if I look at this floor beam that's identical right below it, this is the influence area. Okay, so we'll call this AI. Now, I'm just curious. If I wanted to take AI and divide it by AT, what would I get? Well, I'd get K. Well, what, what is that? No, the other way around. Two, right? So this is two. For interior beams, KLL is two. That, that's what KLL is. If you're wondering what, what that is, Remember how I said that, that sometimes the equation isn't pretty? Well, when live load distribution or when live load reduction was first proposed, it came from collecting data. And you start plotting that data and seeing is there a correlation? Well, there is a correlation between the amount of live load reduction and the influence area. So that's why that, that expression exists. Okay? Again, just comes from collecting data, you know, for you know, on, on office buildings for, you know, n you know, period of years and then looking at it and seeing, well, how can we make this data make sense? So, yes? The yes, they would. That's a great question. And the answer is yes, because think, what is the relationship between the influence area and the tributary area? It's the same thing, right? It'd be two. What about for columns? Think about it. What's the ratio of this area to this area? It's not, it's not 1 to 2, it's 1 to 4. Hence why for columns, the KLL is 4. Now, there are some instances where you have cantilevered elements where the code specifies 3 uh, and whatnot, but for m most practical cases, you're using a value of 2 for beams and a value of uh, 4 for columns, or beams and girders. So Maybe flexural elements, maybe I should use that term. Any questions? Okay. I do want to talk a little bit about another, or I would say the third primary gravity load, and that is snow, which we are ob obviously experiencing a lot of right now, right? That was a joke. That was a joke. Yeah, it's not snowing very much, but um, basically snow loads, um, just like you know other loads, get updated over time. So there's a series of weather stations across the country, and they basically collect snow data, you know, and, and that gets reported uh, in ASC 7, and then that gets turned into uh, appropriate ground snow loads. So uh, have you ever heard, heard the term like a 100-year flood or, you know, 50-year flood or something like that? Basically, what we're designing is off of the 50-year snow. In other words, it's based on the 2% probability uh, that the 50-year snow will be exceeded in a given year. So if you hear the, the, the term MRI, it stands for mean recurrence interval. Uh, the mean recurrence interval that we use for snow right now uh, is, a, is 50 years. Now, this data is reported in ASCE 7, but ASCE 7, it's a book, like it's a physical book. And when you open it, um, you'll find like tables in the appendix uh, that look like this. So they'll be, so for instance, in the state of Alabama, if you're in, you know, Birmingham, here's the, you know, uh, ground snow load. If you're in Arizona, here's the ground snow load, something like that. Now, it's obviously a function of your location, but what the spec says is that the spec says you're supposed to use that in order to determine your, your snow load. Now, it, it's on paper, right? But you're supposed to use that. To be honest, it's 2019, and it's a pain to literally open up a book and, you know, break out the, the compass and go, okay, that's where it is, okay? Luckily, um, there's this uh, engineering group, uh, the AT Council, and they've digitized a lot of these hazard maps. I showed, if you're in steel design, we've actually already looked at this because we looked at this for, uh, for wind and, and for earthquakes. The same website gives you uh, snow, uh, uh, data for snow. So, for instance, um, for, uh, just for, first off, uh, some states have unique snow maps because it depends on their location. So, uh, Alaska has one. Some of the states in the... Uh, 
uh, the Northeast have their own sort of, you know, provisions because, I mean, between elevation and just the temperature there, we, you can get just a varying degree of, uh, of ground snow. Uh, but for most regions in the country, it's pretty straightforward. So uh, I'm going to use the same uh, procedure that I did before. So I'm going to search by coordinate. So let's say we're talking about Huntington, West Virginia. So what I'll do is I'll go to Google and I'll say Huntington, West Virginia, latitude and longitude. Okay, and so that's the latitude and longitude of Huntington. Remember the west coordinate you put in negative because on the x-axis that's, that's negative. So that's that. Then negative that. Search. And so you can see right here, there's the, there's the location, you know, Huntington, West Virginia, obviously. But I don't care about wind. I've got wind, snow, go to snow. And then there you go. So in our region, so first off, when you see this sort of shaded region right here, that shaded region is, um, let me pull this up. So basically, you can, you can probably kind of see it right here. If you sort of see, do you see that? You see this region right here? Uh, let me see if I can draw it with the pen. See that sort of, oh. See that sort of shape right there? You kind of see that? So now you look here. See it's kind of the same shape. Basically, what, uh, what this uh, uh, organization has done is they digitized all the maps and they integrated it with Google Maps. So you put in a, lat a latitude and longitude and then it says, okay, what region on the snow map are you on? Bam, there's your, uh, your ground snow load. So for us, in, in this region of the country, the ground snow load is 20 pounds per square foot. That's going to change if we were looking at, like, Harvard, you know, up in Boston, okay? It's going, that snow load is going to get a little bit higher, right, because it's a little colder up there. Versus if we were looking at Miami, Florida, it's going to drop down a good bit, okay? How, why do we have the same snow load, like long distance snow in Miami? Because, I mean, we're supposed to be all the same anyway. Well, it, it, two things. That, that, that's a great question. It comes from two things. One, it comes from your, your mean recurrence interval. And it also comes from the density of snow. And that, that might seem a little bit of a, a weird determination, but it's not as simple as just, well, they get, you know, six inches and we get three inches. It also comes, the density of snow comes into it as well. So while they may get more snow, it might not be heavier. There we go. There you go. So it, it's all, it's, yeah. But let me say this. Generally, the farther north that you go, the, the heavier the load gets. Yep. Sound good? I mean, think they are farther away, but they're not drastically further away. So. What's the determination of the That's a great question. Remember how I said that ASC 7 gets released, gets updated every different year? Well, so the editions of ASC 7 that have come out, one came out in 2005, one came out in 2010, the one that we're currently operating on is 2016. So, for those, so for our region in the country, for that time period, those ground snow loads haven't changed. But you might look up another location, you might look up a St. Louis, say, and maybe it was 20, 20, and 25. Maybe, oh, now it's got to go up because the data reflects it. Yes, yes. So, pretty straightforward stuff, isn't it? It's, and honestly, this, this tool is, is super neat because you can take this and, you know, print it to PDF and then goes in your calculation notebook. It's pretty neat. Keep in mind that we, ha we haven't even talked about load factors and, and adjusting these for, for uncertainty. We haven't even talked about that yet. Now, there are a couple things um, that we do need to add to this. What this is reporting is, is just a, a ground snow load. And, that, and that's, what, um, that's what all of these maps report. That is the snow load that you see on the ground. Well, if you're designing a, a building, I really don't care about the load on the ground. I care about the load on the roof, right? So how do you transmit a snow load that's on the ground to a snow load that's on the roof? Well, you have to adjust it. So um, what I have here is the computation for flat roofs. Now, most you know, commercial office buildings and large-scale uh, buildings that, that structural engineers are designing, you know, like a building like this, 
the roof can pretty much be taken as flat. Now that's not always the case, and there are some adjustments in the spec for if you have an angled roof. And I'm, I'm not going to go through everything because uh, we we could just talk. We could have a whole class just on on structural loads. Um, but flat roofs are most common nowadays in most commercial uh, applications. When I say flat, I mean flat but sloped just enough for drainage. And a roof that's like that is is pretty much we considered flat. So what we do in order to determine the snow load on the roof, the piece of F, is we take the snow load that's on the ground and we adjust it. Okay, And we adjust it for a couple different things. Number one, we adjust it based on the exposure, which this is actually the exact same determination that we did in steel design when we looked at wind. Because when the wind blows, it changes how much snow is on the roof. So the exposure categories for wind are the exact same exposure categories for snow. Um, we also have to take into account the thermal uh, uh, characteristics of the building. This is a, an odd example, but if you were designing a greenhouse that had a very heated roof, that would change the snow load on the roof because the thermal characteristics of the building would be a little different. Uh, and then we also have to take into account the risk category of the structure. If you're in steel, we already talked about risk categories. If not, we'll... Uh, We'll discuss those uh, in some detail. <clears throat> so the exposure uh, uh, category, uh, or the exposure, co bleh, the exposure coefficient is a lookup. It's a pretty straightforward uh, lookup. So depending upon your exposure category, you're going to determine uh, whether or not your roof is fully exposed, partially exposed, or sheltered. In all honesty, in most cases, your exposure coefficient equals one. There are some instances uh, where it doesn't, um, and so like. To give you kind of an idea of exposure categories, if you're in steel design, you've already seen this. But if not, um, basically when you're designing a structure, and this, this discussion really uh, first shows up when you're talking about wind, uh, but when you're first designing a structure, the, the exposure and, and the, the surroundings uh, around a, a given system are going to affect it, not only its wind characteristics, but as a result, its snow characteristics. In other words, if you're designing a building in the middle of Manhattan, that's being sheltered by all sorts of skyscrapers all around it, that changes how much wind hits the building, right? And if it changes how much wind hits the building, it changes how much snow accumulates on the roof, okay? So whether or not you're designing a building in an urban setting or in a rural setting or in a coastal setting is going to change not only your, your um, uh, uh, wind characteristics but your snow characteristics uh, as well. Now, if you're wondering, well, there's a category B, C, and D, why is there no category A? It's because category A is just a reference in the spec that you use for wind tunnel testing. So if you ever have a really, really unique structure that you need to do uh, wind tunnel testing in order to uh, determine its characteristics, that's what category A is for. Uh, the thermal coefficient, um, <coughs> the thermal coefficient, uh, you know, basically it's like, you know, if you have a, something like a greenhouse, the, the, the snow is going to accumulate, you know, you're going to have less snow accumulating on the roof. Whereas if you have sort of a, a structure where the, the, the building is kept colder, you know, like some sort of cold storage uh, uh, complex, well, the ther thermal coefficient is going to get higher because the snow load is going to get larger. And if you have a cold roof, it's going to attract a little bit more snow. Again, in most cases, uh, that equals one. Now, the importance factor, this is where the spec takes into account just the general uh, importance uh, of a given uh, structure. We're, we're looking at uh, risk categories. So the idea is that as the risk category goes up, the amount of snow that we need to consider goes up, even if it doesn't actually see that. You know, if you're designing a, a police station, I don't care if it doesn't actually see that snow, we're going to take some extra precaution. We're going to bump up our snow load. Okay? Speaking of, I'll go over risk categories very, very briefly. So there are four risk categories that are defined uh, in ASC 7, and it just depends on the type of structure that we're looking at. So it goes from risk category four, which is um, you know, a structure whose failure would inhibit you know, the community or would impact the community. So like, if a commercial office building fails, it sucks. But if a fire station uh, or a police station uh, uh, fails, yeah, that doesn't affect just them. That affects the whole town, the whole city. So the risk category would go up if you're looking at a hospital, a 911 center, a police station, fire station. That would be a risk category four structure. Risk category one, on the other hand, would be a structure that if it failed, it really would present a negligible risk uh, to the public. So we're talking about like an unmanned warehouse or a, a grain silo, a barn, something that, that if it falls, 
probably the, the general public is going to be fine. Uh, risk category three is a structure that would house a large number of people in one place uh, or a structure where the, the people inside are going to have a limited ability to escape. So we're talking about elementary schools. We're talking about uh, uh, health care facilities, you know, uh, like a nursing home. We're also talking about theaters and lecture halls, you know, places where there's a lot of people all congregated uh, in one location. That would be a risk category three. Risk category two is basically everything that wouldn't fit into these, uh, these general uh, these general categories. I, probably not, because it, category three is more reserved for pe for people that really can't help themselves in, in that scenario. Um, so you're talking about because let me put it like this: you wouldn't consider just a regular office building, you know, a, a risk category three. Yet it's probably the same amount of people. Whereas if it's something like a, 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 an elementary school or a preschool and you have a bunch of little kids, you know, they, they aren't able to help themselves like we are. So. No, it would be a two. It wouldn't be a, a risk category four. It, 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 I know what you're saying, but, but it, it's, not, it's not really the same story. One of the things, though, as a structural engineer designing Walmarts, it can kind of be a little boring because the structures are very regular and very they're very grid-like. The only thing that really changes is the snow load. I mean, really. I mean, they're one story, and the load just goes on the ground, so you don't have to design any floor beams. All you have to do is have columns spaced you know, in a grid and make sure the roof can hold up the snow, and that's it. They're so, sh I mean, they do see wind, but those structures are so built, you know, that the wind usually isn't the biggest deal in the world. I mean, I'm not saying you don't have to evaluate it, but um, it's usually not that, that big of a deal. Usually the snow is. Like if you were designing a Walmart in Alaska, that'd be different, so, versus a Walmart in Hawaii. Fort Knox? <laughs> it might. I mean, I, I would imagine that uh, that there's probably a policy that, okay, if it's the White House, we're just going to consider it risk category seven or, or, some, or, or, something, or something like that, you know, what, whatever, um, or Fort Knox. I mean, but in that scenario, I mean, there's probably, you know, like if you're talking about military installations, they probably have their own design standards and whatnot, and if it's something classified, then I'm certainly not putting it on a YouTube recording. No. <laughs> no. Don't arrest me. Please don't arrest me. <laughs> <laughs> No, not really. Not really. Um, uh, I see what you're saying, but um, it doesn't affect it that much. And, and as a rule, I probably would just assume the worst case anyways. Yeah. Any other questions? This is good stuff. Now, I'm sure that some of you in structural analysis were like triangular loads. Even really deals with triangular loads. Who really sees that? Do we really deal with triangular loads on beams? Come on, Dr. Mike. Yes, you do. Um, one uh, one very real instance where you actually do have to analyze for triangular loads is is what's called a snow drift. So you have snow accumulated on a roof, uh, then the wind blows. What happens is you can have uh, regions of the roof where the snow accumulates more. Uh, uh, collectively in, in one uh, uh, side of the roof versus the other. So for instance, if you're looking at, let me see if I can draw this out. If you look at you know, this side of the roof right here, you can kind of see how the snow has sort of bunched up in sort of a triangular load. And there, there are a series of load cases, uh, and I, I'm not going to get into all the details, but there are a series of load cases spelled out in ASC 7 dependent upon the geometry of your roof where you would have to consider snow drifts. How many of you have ever been on a, a large scale or a large like commercial office building like roof? And you see, you go on the roof and it's flat for the most part. A lot of them have just like gravel 
like you know gravel stone but then there's that little curtain wall you know that little little two foot lip right there well snow can collect on that two foot wall also usually in the center of the building there's um you might have like a six foot high wall that you know houses all the mechanical equipment for the building and so snow can accumulate uh, along those as well and so you have to uh, design accordingly uh, like I said, I'm not talking about everything, but I just wanted you to be aware that there are some additional uh, uh, issues that you need to consider. Um, yes? So in that picture, um, who decided all that liquid stuff would get on the wall? They were on the other building. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> um, uh, a couple other uh, wind or load events. I'm going to talk about this really briefly because we talk about this in great detail in steel design. Uh, if you're interested, take steel design if you're not already in there. Um, but number one, uh, wind, uh, is, wind and earthquakes are really the two primary lateral events, lateral loads uh, that buildings experience. Um, design for lateral loads versus design for gravity loads is very different uh, because when you're designing for gravity loads, think. There's a beam holding up this floor, right? There's a beam holding up the floor above. Well, designing those two beams is really the same process. Whereas with wind, the wind forces change as the building gets taller. So as the building gets taller, wind can really start to become a problem. Um, and, and so that, that, that really is a little bit, it creates a challenge as, as to how you, as a structural engineer, not just design an individual component, but the entire system. Um, the base wind pressure equation, I'm not going to get in, into very significant details, but the long and short of it is this is basically just Bernoulli's equation for uh, treating wind as a fluid. You put in the unit weight of air and a, a unit conversion to, throw, to convert miles per hour into a pressure in pounds per square foot, uh, and then that's basically what you get. Um, we adjust it with a few uh, uh, exposure coefficients and, and uh, uh, various adjustment factors. I'm not really going to get into the details here. But that's basically the, the long and short of what we need to know in here. Uh, you can look up wind speed. It's a, it's a wind speed map just like it is for snow. Uh, it's a very similar uh, situation. For earthquakes, um, the big thing about earthquakes, earthquakes really don't apply a force to a building. They uh, apply an acceleration to a building. So the way that you get your load is sort of like force equals mass times acceleration. The building itself has a very significant weight to it. Uh, you take that uh, building, apply an acceleration, or apply an acceleration, because that's what an earthquake does. The ground is moving, so it's accelerating the building. So that's how you get your your lateral forces uh, for the purpose of design. And those lateral forces are, of course, dependent upon where you are in the country. Now, here in Huntington, West Virginia, we really don't have to worry too much about uh, earthquake hazards because we we don't really see er, you know significant earthquake uh, forces. But we can uh, in, in some regions uh, of the country. Uh, you know, Western Kentucky can see some pretty high hazards. California, Alaska, some pretty significant uh, uh, potential uh, earthquake hazards. Um, the last thing I want to show you before we call it for, uh, for the day, and this will be real quick, are load combinations. So we've got all of these different uh, load events, dead loads, live loads, snow loads, wind loads, all this stuff. Um, ultimately, what we need to do is combine them to generate what are called factored loads. So if you ever hear me use the term service loads, uh, service loads are loads that are unfactored. Factored loads are ones where the factors uh, have been applied. Now these two bold equations are probably the ones we're going to use the most, and I really only want to focus on the dead load and the live load, because every single structure that's ever designed has to be able to hold up at the very least its own self-weight and whatever it's being designed for. You know, if it's an office building, it has to hold up itself and the loads for the office. Um, the load combos that we use, so for instance, if you look at load combo 2, 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, why is the load factor for live loads higher? Well, it's higher because we have less certainty associated with estimating live loads than we do dead loads. It's pretty easy to figure out how much a structure weighs. You have a unit weight, a volume, it's pretty simple. But estimating how much force we are applying to the floor and then how much force the next class is applying to the floor, yeah, that's, that's kind of complicated. So as a result, our load factors associated with those uh, uncertain events go up. So, um, so, so yeah, so those load combos, we're going to see those quite a bit throughout the semester. 
for now, we really aren't going to desperately need them other than, uh, uh, I think there's one instance on your homework assignment where you do, but um, I have it spelled out on your homework assignment. Speaking of, uh, this is homework one. I have it posted on Blackboard. It's pretty simple. Uh, it's not due till January 28th, so you have plenty of time to do it. There's three problems. Problem number one, I'm giving you a very representative floor uh, plan and asking you to determine the factored moment on a floor beam and the factored load on a given column. Uh, you have to perform live load reduction and uh, do some load factoring. Pretty, pretty straightforward. As for uh, problem two, I gave you a floor plan that's a, a little more intricate. Um, you don't have to do any load factoring or any, or any reduction, but you got the, the distribution uh, is a little uh, funkier. I'll give you time next Friday if you've got any questions uh, and whatnot. Problem three is I just want you to find the ground snow load at Iowa State University. So just making you do, I just picked a random university and said, okay, tell me what the ground snow load is. So that's due not Monday, but the following Monday. So you got plenty of time on this. This is actually a, a pretty short assignment. Sound good? Next Friday, uh, unless you're in SEAL design, 10 minutes. So <laughs> that's all I got. We'll see you.